Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rotor Talk Live, Season 3, Episode 54 Replay. Brendan Schulman, Vice President of Policy and Legal Affairs for DJI. Back in June, we had Brendan Schulman on, and we had a great hour discussing, among other things, the data privacy concerns regarding DJI and DJI drones. And then we also spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about DJI's response to the FAA's proposed remote ID. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and roll that clip in its entirety. A reminder, this has been set as a premiere, so you'll be able to interact and chat with each other. Let's roll that clip. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rotor Talk Live, Season 3, Episode 25. Very special guest, Brendan Schulman from DJI. Brendan is the Vice President of Policy and Legal Affairs for DJI. Brendan, how are you this evening? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Very good. We're real fortunate and uh, very thankful that you're able to spend spend some time with us tonight. And um, we're just going to kind of get right into it. Now, I know uh, there was an article that just came out today uh, regarding data privacy. And I know I know Booz Allen, Allen Hamilton very well, a former friend of mine. Um, well, not a former friend, but uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine worked for them. And uh, they did another independent study. And it shows that there was no data breach as far as DJI was concerned. Would you, could you care to elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, sure, happy to. So uh, as, as you and your viewers know, we've had many articles and accusations over the past weeks, months, years, however you count it, um, all, all to sort of the same allegation that somehow DJI drones are automatically sending your flight logs and photos or videos either to us at DJI and or the Chinese government. And so um, what, what Booz Allen Hamilton did uh, on behalf of Precision Hawk was to look at three DJI models, uh, the two government edition platforms, as well as the Mavic 2 Enterprise, uh, and do a, a really close analysis of, uh, of, the, sec of the security. And, and their, their conclusions, uh, from my point of view, are entirely consistent with what we've been saying for years, as well as the probably four prior validations going all the way back to 2018. We had the Kivu audit back then. Uh, after that, we had the um, Department of the Interior program, DHS, which uh, supported the Department of the Interior. And if you go back even further than that, there was a NOAA, uh, the National Oceanographic uh, and Atmospheric uh, Agency, did an analysis as well. And they all kind of say the same thing. In, in this case, confirming um, in the analysis saying there's no evidence that uh, data is sent to DJI or China or to other unexpected uh, parties. So I think that's that's great news, although in some ways I, I think it's not news. It's just more of the same. There's never been evidence that we've seen that the drones are sending data when you don't want them to. Um, and, and so I think that's further reason to be confident uh, in, in our products. And, you know, unfortunately, in this political climate, we've seen a lot of proposals that would nonetheless uh, shut down uh, federal government programs such as the Department of the Interior or even across the federal government, uh, or that would actually uh, prohibit you from using a drone with the Chinese component in it if you're the recipient of federal funding. And even uh, in, in one draft executive order that was reported by Politico, um, prohibit you from flying over federally managed lands. So I, I guess that's the post office if you um, uh, are flying a, a drone that's made in China or has Chinese components. So the policies have gone sort of all the way to, to, to paranoia, if you will. Uh, and yet, when you when you have an analysis like this, particularly from a reputable firm like Booz Allen Hamilton, it just confirms what we've been saying for years, which is that you're in control of the data. You have a choice. There's no need to synchronize or to send us data. Uh, we have no business model that, that relies or, or turns on any of that stuff, so so just don't do it, and you know go on and use the products productively, including fighting fires, saving lives, or just having fun. Well, you know, um, and, and I think you, you probably saw it, and and it was I, I can't say it was probably within the last month or two. I know Romeo Dersher, who I've had on the show before, and I absolutely love ha having him on, and the work that he does is just you know it, it's just out of this world. I, I can't say enough for what he does. And uh, he's been a great personal friend to me as well. 
um, you know, but he, he pointed out quite accurately, you know, that taking some of these drones away and taking them out of the picture is going to cost lives. And, you know, Brandon, I don't know about you, but there's no price tag you can put on a life. I mean, if a, if a Phantom 4 Pro, you know, that's used by a police department, you know, happens to spot somebody, um, you know, or, you know, one of the Mavic 2 Enterprise series spots somebody uh, that's been lost, you know, that's a life that's been saved. I mean, there's no price tag on that. You're absolutely right. And I, I think our count is up to like 370 people who've been saved by uh, by drones from things like fires and floods, missing people, uh, people who are mentally ill and wander away, uh, including in many life threatening scenarios. Um, so absolutely access to the technology is really important. And, and a policy proposal that just says, hey, this product is made here, so it can't be used. That's really not a smart approach. If we care about data security, just like when we care about risk and, and, and other things, or just like is true for other technologies, let's understand what the data security profile is, particularly in the kind of operation that you're doing. Is it sensitive, is it not? Uh, in many cases, the operations are obviously not sensitive. You're monitoring a fire in a forest. I can't imagine why that's sensitive to anyone. Uh, and in many cases, the government operation is even publicly releasable. The information has to be made public. Uh, so let's look at the facts, really, rather than the, uh, the political uh, objectives of some people, and, and make sure that valuable life-saving equipment is not taken away. And again, the, if you think more broadly in terms of what's going on in the uh, policy environment, maybe we'll get into this with other topics tonight. This really, these policies placed purported national security ahead of everything else, right? So there's some. If you think about it, there's something that is threatening about the aerial perspective, such that the government is proposing to take away certain people or certain agencies' ability to choose the products and to mitigate their own security issues. I mean, when you think about it that way, uh, considering that anyone can buy a drone and fly it, what does that mean for the operators? If you're someone who wants to fly a drone uh, and, and drones are inherently a national security risk because they might be sending data somewhere. And what does that mean for your data? Because I don't think you've been security uh, validated uh, in any way. So I, I think ultimately if, if the policies are driven only by security and especially by improper understandings of security, we're all at risk because th then it's, it's the case that no one with a drone can be trusted. Doesn't matter where the drone is made. We have to shrink the number of, of people flying drones and, and uh, authorized pilots out there because there's some kind of national security risk that is uh, prompted when you have an aerial perspective of certain kinds of locations. I think that should be a great concern. And if you go back a few years, the FAA was supposed to, um, under the Section 2209 framework from the, the statute a few years ago, the FAA was supposed to have a process to designate certain locations as being restricted for drone operations. They have not done that. They're supposed to cover critical infrastructure and similar things. Uh, so look, I'm, I'm all for risk-based solutions. And if someone were to figure out where are the drones actually a threat, I'd be fully in support of limiting um, or, or otherwise filtering their operation. In fact, we do that with geofencing, but we're sort of guessing. Airports are obvious, other places are not, prisons. But we're trying to keep the drones away from things that might be sensitive. We have no interest in the products being used uh, in any way that makes people uncomfortable. Most of the operations, as you pointed out, are, are not like that. They're life-saving, they're public safety missions, firefighting, and by far the benefits are, are, are well-established by now. We have to make sure the policies don't get in the way. Well, you know, for us hobbyists, you know, we, we look at it as, as, as a hobby. It's something that recreationally that we do and that we enjoy, you know, photography and videography and just, you know, you know, it, it kind of gives you, it, it's kind of like that, you know, my dad was into golfing. Okay. And, and for me, you know, it, it, it's evolved into from, I had gas powered planes when I was younger and now it's evolved into, into drones. And I absolutely love it. I love the technology. I love what, how, how DJI just increasingly just ups the ante each time the Mavic Air 2. I could talk to you for hours about how much I like it. But, you know, the, the thing is, and, and you pointed it out so well, you know, and, and here for, for our instance, okay, why would, 
somebody want to know about the dimensions of my lake in my ba- in, behind my house? Or, you know, when I flew down to the uh, Bay Bridge here in Tampa, um, you know, why is somebody going to want to know that data? I mean, it's just it's just absolutely, you know, you know, there is also there there is a need for national security, and that's to be understood. But you know, right. you're you're looking under rocks here, and you're not finding things. You know, this is like you said, the fourth study that was done. You know, let's move on here. And I think one of the other things that I want to say is this: I know that the government apparently has contracted with Parrot to be able to do some things with them. Okay, now you know, I know some of my drone people out there. Um, have the Anafi and they love the Anafi, but but I'm but I'm going to say this, okay? You know that's not a solution for you know real time enterprise use, okay? That's not a, that's not a drone that's going to be equipped to do that. There are so many shortcomings as far as it you know being an enterprise type of level drone. Well, look, I, my my role has never been about uh, promoting one product over another. The, the work that I've done for five years and even before. I was a DJI, I was really to advocate for everyone to have the use of, of a drone uh, in a way that's least burdensome and most reasonable with respect to the regulations. So really the work that I do benefits everyone um, when it comes to things like remote ID or registration or flight over people or uh, things we've done in terms of state and local legislation. Um, I, I, don't, I don't make advocacy into a, a matter of one product person versus another. and on. On these issues, the security issues, the point is let the customers choose. You know, let the Department of Defense um, support and buy an American drone. Makes sense to me. Obviously, they're going to have very high standards. DJI has not marketed or advertised its products for military use. Uh, go ahead and, 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 and buy what you want. But when, when you have policymakers who clearly don't understand the technology and haven't read the, the facts that have been put out in these validations, um, saying, no, you, you just can't use or buy the product just because of where it's made, that's when we're in trouble. And by the way, many American uh, branded products are also contain pro- uh, components made in China. In fact, the entire Department of Interior fleet is grounded, not just the DJI drones that only make up like 17%. So really the impact is, is, is devastating and broad and goes well beyond one company versus another. I, uh, I, I remember working with uh, the folks that pair it on things like registration and flight over people, um, I, I, you know, more power to them if they have a product that uh, competes in the marketplace. That's the way it should be. I'm, I absolutely, I'm I'm in agreement with that. You know, one the, the main topic that we really want to spend some time and, and focused on because I know um, you were very passionate about it and and you were very involved with it is remote ID. And what I'd like to start off with tonight, Brendan, if you could kind of give us. Uh, an, you know, an encapsulated version of, of how the whole idea got started for remote ID, and then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, sure, it's a, it's a bit of a tale, but I think it's important to, to understand the, the backstory here. Um, so I, I, it, it mostly starts in the fall of 2016, when Congress put into the, um, the FAA Extension Act, that's a, a bill that provided uh, you know, funding for the FAA. Each each federal agency has to be reauthorized every few years, and the FAA bill was being negotiated for a number of years. But one in one extension version of that said, "Hey, FAA, go go and figure out how to do remote identification uh, using industry standards. You know, figure out how to get that done." Um, and then uh, what happened? Remember, 2016 is when Part 107 was finalized. The next step that FAA had on its schedule was let's figure out flight over people and night operations because those are excluded from part 107. And we're all looking forward to to that in part because operations at night and over people are life-saving. So in early 2017, as FAA was getting ready to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking for flight over people, the federal security agencies, uh, including FBI, DOJ, um, DHS said, wait a second, we're, we're now worried about national security flight over crowds. If we don't know who's flying the drones in that way, we, we have a security issue that we uh, can't resolve. We don't know whether that person is authorized or not. And, and of course, you can just look to the, to the media environment. At that time, there are many scary stories about uh, the threat of drones, either at airports or crowds or, or, or what have you. 
So that was early 2017, and, and the security agencies uh, basically said to the FAA, you can't move forward with any expanded rulemaking for other ways of flying drones beyond Part 107 uh, unless and until there's remote ID. So starting that year, the FAA got very serious about moving up the remote ID initiative, which had already been uh, uh, sort of on their list from Congress, to being the next thing they had to do. And so they stood up the Aviation Rulemaking Committee on Remote ID, that I'll, I'll call that the ARC, A-R-C. I was on that along with 70 or 72 other people representing various interests that we can talk about. But at that point, we, we all got together and um, spent really the whole summer, in some sense, uh, meeting uh, and, and trying to figure out for the FAA, how can you accomplish remote ID, mostly in a technical way? What are the technologies available? And also, what are some of the policy uh, considerations? Um, so really, the and then from, from that report, which went to the FAA in the fall of 2017, we waited over two years for the FAA to get out its notice of proposed rulemaking, which is the FAA's proposal for how to get it done. And we can talk about how the ARC report differs from what the FAA put out and who was on the ARC and things like that if you want. But that's the, the backstory is there's, a, there's an urgent uh, and sort of um, overarching need articulated by federal security agencies that remote ID has to get done before anything else can happen in terms of um, UAS rulemaking. And so that's where we still are, um, although now we're finally in this uh, period between the proposed rule and the finalization of the rule. Back in January, um, DJI came out with an article called, uh, we strongly support drone remote ID, but not like this, which, which you contributed to, and it was an excellent article. Um, it talked about broadcast remote ID, um, and it leverages existing technology. And um, can you make our viewers just aware of, of what it is and what technology this leverages that's already there? Yeah, sure. So um, given the story I just related about how important remote ID is to the federal government, and by the way, the same types of uh, needs are also present in Europe and elsewhere. So uh, really this is, drone remote ID is gonna happen. And, and you could see that in late 2016 or at least by early to mid 2017. So, and there are good reasons for it. It, it does make sense to have accountability like a license plate on your car, right? So, so remote ID makes a lot of sense, but my personal perspective as well as DJI's has been, let's get it done, but in a way that uh, accomplishes two things respect the privacy of the drone operators because where they operate and who they are is personal information and in some cases it can be business sensitive information or it could just be information about uh, a young a young student flying in the backyard and number two let's make sure that the solution is not overly costly you know if we can do this in a way that's efficient or even free and easy just like you stick the license plate on your car you know after you buy it and you never think about the license plate again, maybe you got to put the windshield sticker on, uh, which is an inspection issue, not, not so much a, a registration issue, but basically your license plate is, is, is done once you put the plate on your car after you buy your car. So can we make remote ID like that, easy and, and, and cheap or free? And that's really the um, approach we took in the, in the ARC as well as in developing our own solution called Aeroscope, is let's use existing technology so that ultimately you, the, the users of the technology, aren't faced with unnecessary costs and hassles, as well as an evasion of privacy that might come if you were to require all the drones to be networked to one system that's collecting all the flight information. So, so what we wrote in the, um, the Viewpoints blog post that you're mentioning is really our reaction to the FAA proposal in light of the discussions that we had at the ARC, including the report that recommended either broadcast or network. Um, and, and what is this broadcast network? Well, broadcast is just a radio signal transmission out from the drone, uh, which should be pretty familiar to you. It's just like what's already there in terms of watching the video downlink. That is a signal that's being sent from the drone over radio to your remote controller versus network, which was uh, uh, sort of the method that was uh, advocated by uh, various parties at the ARC, which would require each drone 
first to connect to the internet and feed the, the ID information through the internet to uh, some kind of network system, which then ultimately provides it to the law enforcement officer or whoever on the ground needs it. So from our perspective, let's do this the simplest and most direct and easiest way, which is just broadcast your license plate type of information to whoever's nearby who might be impacted by the flight of the drone, rather than uh, connecting the drone to a whole network infrastructure in order to accomplish the same thing in a very circuitous way with a lot of costs and, and steps and hassle uh, that would be imposed on, on the users. So DJI's perspective, we, we understand remote ID is important, it's gotta get done uh, and, and we are supportive of it, but we can't support a solution that is more burdensome or more invasive than it needs to be. And that was our reaction to the FA proposal uh, on the first read, especially, which is what you're you're referring to, is that blog post that I think went up uh, just a couple weeks after the NPRM came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the things, and, and you, there's a couple of things that um, I know I've been getting a lot of comments about whenever I, we've been talking about remote ID. Um, one of them is, you know, the 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 ARC proposal is something, and this is something I've been in IT my whole career, Brendan, for 30 years. And whenever a system is designed, okay, it's what they call architected out. And then, you know, they put it through some simulations because, you know, um, our, our VPs and above, they want to want to see that this is going to work before they commit to spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a new system. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but what the ARC proposed was never actually, you know, it, it was just on paper. And what the DJI solution, if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, there was an actual demo of it up in Montreal. Yeah, the, um, th that's right. The uh, so the the ARC uh, was sort of just people talking about different ideas, but we very quickly reduced one of those ideas to practice, namely the uh, the broadcast method. Uh, now, we did that using the technology we had available, which was the existing protocols on our drones, uh, understanding that at some point, just like any other IT industry type of solution, you need to standardize it so that anyone can create the transmitter and the receiver. Um, so uh, that's, that process took place at ASTM International, which is a standards define, defining body. And what they did, and it was FAA and other industry companies, is to define the broadcast method as basically Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. So the solution, if you will, to broadcast is something that already exists. It, it leverages Wi-Fi and Bluetooth protocols to simply provide uh, the remote ID information on a protocol that's already accessible by the smartphone that's in your pocket. And that and that's sort of the, one of the goals that the FAA articulated is Remote ID is not just for security officials, it's for the public. The public at some level needs to be able to pull out their phone and read the ID number and then if necessary, report that drone to the authorities when the authorities aren't there. So that means you gotta get the information to something that, that you're holding already. We all have smartphones. There's two ways to get stuff to a smartphone. One is uh, to send it by Wi-Fi or broadcast. Is it Wi-Fi or Bluetooth broadcast? Uh, those of you who have an iPhone, you know, AirDrop is sort of like that. Like you, you can AirDrop in the absence of uh, internet. It's a direct transmission. So is broadcast remote ID. You don't need the internet. Uh, the other way to get information to a cell phone or another connected device is through the internet, which means that both the receiver and the sender need to be connected to it. Um, and that, you know, that's the other way to do it is to send the uh, information uh, you know, probably over the cell phone system uh, or possibly over a Wi-Fi connected to the, the internet and to get that information uh, on your phone. So the, these, uh, this sort of technology path really developed between the ARC and the, uh, and the FAA proposal. Now what the FAA proposal says is do it both ways. Uh, our proposal, the FAA says our proposal is broadcast and connect via the internet including paying a, an anticipated monthly subscription fee to the remote ID service providers uh, just to get the information to the same point, which is uh, the official or the member of the public who wants to know 
who's flying or, or, or other identifiable information relating to the drone operator. Well, you know, it's a given, you know, anything above having like the Mavic Mini, there's a registration fee for us, okay? And if you wanna pursue your part 107, that runs $150 and that's every two years you have to go up that. And those are givens and those are, I think, just just very well accepted in the drone community. And, you know, and, you know, you, you count the cost when you when you decide to get into this hobby, you know, uh, you know, b b besides the hardware and the equipment, you know, you have to do things like the registration and so forth. And that's a given. But, you know, one of the other things that people have said was, you know what, I've, I've paid. I should be able to go up and fly to my heart's content without having to worry about pay a fee to somebody say like AirMap or Kitty Hawk or, or another service provider, you know, just to do this when this, te like you've mentioned, the technology is already there that they don't need to be involved with something like this. Yeah, and that, that, that's what we would like to see because we want to solve the problem, but we, we don't want to interfere in the beneficial operations. And, and to go back to your prior question, so, so look, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth exist and we did that demo in Montreal uh, Aeroscope, you could say, uh, going back over two years, was a demo of broadcast working in the real world, and it has solved problems at airports and security events and facilities. Uh, but the standard is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and so in November in Montreal, we showed that the Bluetooth, uh, sorry, the Wi-Fi uh, broadcast also works in an urban environment right to your phone, sort of a drone-to-phone type of, of, of concept. The network solution that's been that's in the FA proposal uh, has never been tested in the real world. I don't even know that it's been prototyped. There's sort of an assumption that if you connect all these pieces through the internet, you can provide the data at a sufficient, sufficiently low latency to solve the remote ID need, uh, but that hasn't been established. And in fact, uh, there are companies right now that have been tapped to, to develop that, uh, but sort of that's after the proposal already says we're gonna have to do it. So it, it is kind of curious that that the rule says this is the way you're going to have to do it in the absence of evidence that it can be done that way. And one of our uh, comments in our NPRM filing, it was was just that. How, how can we depend? And by the way, the FA is requiring the motors to be kept off until the remote ID system online is, is confirmed to be working. So it's almost like, a, like an interlock, uh, meaning that if something goes wrong, if there's a a lag in the internet or the remote ID service uh, isn't reachable or there's a cybersecurity attack, speaking of cybersecurity, uh, none of the drones in the country can take off because no one can reach the remote ID provider even though they have access to the internet. Um, so we said in our comment, how can you do that? That's that's creating a almost like a single point of failure for something that might be a life-saving operation. So there are all kinds of reasons to be concerned about the FA proposal. We wrote 80 plus pages on that, explaining why, including an analysis of costs. But you're right, the, the, the bottom line here is that, look, it, remote ID is, is coming, it's important. I think it actually will provide a lot of solutions to many different policy challenges that we have. But it's gotta be done the right way so that it's successful. You know, if 50% of people flying drones hate it and don't wanna do it because it costs too much uh, and, and it interferes in their enjoyment or their business, then you're going to have a solution that fails and ultimately that goes back to the original security uh, 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 requirement that the drones be identified if you can only identify half of them then you don't have a solution at all and now you have half the people doing remote id half of them not and therefore one out of two drones that comes across the stadium uh, what has to be shot down or is potentially a rogue drone the, the point of remote id is to is to eliminate uh, the uh, the friendlies and focus on the drones that are actually a threat in a security scenario. And that becomes a goal that can't be accomplished if remote ID is not successful. And so our advocacy, including in that blog piece, is we need remote ID to be successful so that people can continue to use and enjoy drones and society is comfortable with them. And that's why we have to do it in, in a way that's low cost and, and reasonable to the end users. Um, I have a friend who lives out in Idaho, and he flies in Class G airspace all the time, okay? In fact, um, he lives by the Snake River Canyon where Evil Knievel did his jump out there. And a lot of times when he gets out there, he has no cell phone service. There's no carrier out there. So he said for him, his best flying location 
would be moot. He wouldn't be able to fly out there with something like that. And, you know, and I know there are several other ones here who live near Class G airspace, and it would be the same for them. I mean, they just w would have to not be able to fly there anymore. So uh, actually, th that that is, in all of this, there's this misconception about what the proposal is. Um, and I'm not sure where this started, but it seems to persist, including in many comments that I, I read that were filed with the FAA. The proposal does not say that you need to be connected to the internet. Um, what it says is if the internet is available, then you must be connected to the internet. Okay. Uh, now, th there's a whole theoretical discussion, especially if you're in IT, that we could have about what it means to have availability of the internet. In theory, if you have a satellite phone, you can reach the internet from the moon or, you know, so, and that was a, a, a section of our comments saying you can't have availability of the internet be a trigger for uh, a regulatory requirement. Uh, but that is what the proposal says. If you have I think Brendan probably hit the wrong button there. We'll hang on a second here. Yeah, Brendan was talking about, um, you know, we had just, uh, you know, we found out, you know, that an internet connection really, quote unquote, technically isn't needed. And that's what that's what he was discussing the latest of here. So I think he probably accidentally hit mute. But um, as soon as we get him back, we'll get him back here. Um, you know, he's bringing up a lot of good points as far as um, as far as remote ID is concerned. And, you know, DJI solution, DJI wants this to work, okay? And, and in order for this to work, you know, he, he brought up a good point. <laughs> Welcome maybe, back. Maybe, maybe it was uh, ironic that that happened during my during that, that discussion. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 the timing of that is, is, is absolutely <laughs> incredible. Um, um, go ahead, continue. Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, actually, my laptop timed out, uh, I need to change the power save feature. But so that was not an internet uh, failure. That was a laptop timeout failure. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, the, so what the proposal says, like, if, if you can reach the internet, then you have to connect to it and do this remote ID service. But if you're in a place that doesn't have internet, like the places you're describing, then you can do the broadcast instead. Okay, now, I still think there's going to be edge cases that are a problem. Like, what if you barely have uh, connectivity to the tower enough to sort of have the internet there, but data is not really going through. Now you've got a remote ID system failure, it seems, and FAA's proposal says the drone has to stop itself from taking off in a situation where internet is available, but the remote ID service is not working. So there's still a problem in places you're describing where you're sort of on the edge of connectivity. And, and that's certainly a, a major concern. But I, I, I do want to dispel this sort of um, myth that's come up uh, in, in the common process that uh, if you're in a place with no internet connectivity that you're grounded, that's actually not what the proposal says. Okay. That's, thank you for clearing that up tonight. You know, and I know I, I looked over DJI's comment, if you will, and a 98 page comment. And, um, you know, that was some that was I, I read about five, five to 10 pages of it. And, and it was well laid out, well organized, well done. And I know, you know, a lot of other drone reviewers, you know, like myself, you know, we we put some very thoughtful comments out there. I know. And of course, you know, there were a number of rogue comments out there that weren't really you know, using probably profanity and so forth that really just needed to be ignored. But I think one of the things, one of the takeaways that I got was, you know, when when we heard the news, you know, just just recently about them going forward with this was it felt like to a lot of my my subscribers, a lot of viewers, like kind of like a slap in the face from the FAA. We're going to take all your comments, but we're basically going to ignore them, you know. Well, I hope they don't. Um, uh, in the part 107 comment process, they, they did take some of the comments and made changes. For example, um, the original limit was 400 feet above ground, uh, above ground level that changed to 400 feet above a structure. Mm -hmm. Um, originally package delivery was prohibited and 
uh, the final result was package delivery is permitted be, uh, within visual line of sight. So um, they're supposed to take thoughtful uh, and constructive comments into account. And, and I hope they do. Uh, I have heard that they've completed the entire review of the 53,000 comments, which is impressive. Uh, <laughs> the um, part one of seven, I think, had maybe 5,000 comments. And it, it took them, well, I, I'm not sure how long it took them to review those. But the entire process of finalizing the rule took about a year and a half. Uh, and here, I, I've heard the FA is aiming to get this out by the end of the year, uh, which is, you know, that would be about a year, which is aggressive for an agency to finish a rule, particularly when they get tens of thousands of comments. Now, a lot of those comments, I, I don't know how many are cut and paste, and those tend to just be treated as one comment if they're sort of originating from a you know, trade group or, or some kind of uh, advocacy type thing. Um, so maybe to some extent that explains the speed. Um, but uh, look, we'll have to see. I, I think it's um, it's still possible to talk to FAA and, and make sure they've heard your concerns. At some point, you can talk to your members of Congress, to, especially if, if you have someone who uh, in your district, uh, representing your district, who sits on one of the oversight committees, uh, you know, the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee or the Senate Commerce Committee. Um, that, you know, could be one route is to, is to tell Congress that you're concerned. Um, also, the FAA Symposium is coming up to the extent you have, you plan to go to that, you can send your comments to the FAA. Um, even though that's a virtual symposium this year, I believe there's some ability to connect directly with FAA officials. But, you know, look, it's a democracy, right? Like the, the comments are supposed to be reflected in the outcome. And um, depending on which issue you care about, um, there would need to be some significant justification, I would think, for disregarding uh, many thoughtful comments. I, I hope that's not the case. Yeah, same same as well here. Same same, same here with me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also a member of the AMA, the Academy of Model Aeronautics. And... Um, you know, one of my one of my side hobbies is RC planes, and I mean, I've, I've that's been kept dormant for a while. I don't have a YouTube channel on it, and I don't talk a lot about it. But um, you know, what those folks do for for this community is absolutely fantastic. I mean, some of the fields that were 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 you know they they do their flying are just manicured; they're perfect. I mean, you know, it's like a community in and of itself, and, and it's very fantastic. And, you know, this proposal, you know, is going to kind of like turn their world upside down uh, as far as, you know, as far as flying there. Now they would have to be able to let drone um, pilots be able to fly in, in that if they're in the, in the, uh, with it, within the, the airport zone. Um, and I know, and, and and I saw out there, and you had mentioned about cutting and pasting in comments. I know that they were encouraging their members to do that, and that was probably the worst thing in the world. I no, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. Um, in fact, I, I I do think it's good to show um, that a lot of people care, um, but it's not the best thing in the world. You know what you what you want to do with the with a comment to an agency is, is tell your story and, and sh describe the impact that the proposal will have on you individually, particularly with data, like, you know, this is gonna cost me twice as much, or um, I, I, I built, I'm someone who builds old fashioned model airplanes um, that aren't gonna be able to connect to the internet. And I don't belong to AMA, there's no club anywhere in my area. So when the, F when the FAA estimates that it's, I forget what, like a 20 mile drive to the nearest field, that doesn't apply to me. My cost of flying in a place under this rule is gonna be you know, $100 a month. Like that, that's data that tells your story and the, the FAA is supposed to take into account. If it's just, you know, this proposal is bad because um, you know, it, it ruins our fun and, and you cut and paste that, 30,000 times, okay, like that's, that, that shows there's passion and engagement, but ultimately the FAA is probably not going to act on something that's that generic. So it really depends what you say and, and, and how you say it. And particularly if you have specific stories and I, in our 
um, materials that we put out in terms of tips on commenting, we said, tell your story, like, you know, <laughs> get out there and, 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 you know, you're an educator at a school who's got, you know, you know, classes of students who, who want to learn about drones or aviation. And, and this is now going to be a burden somehow. Um, that's the kind of, I've seen comments like that just in the system. And I was looking at them a couple months ago and I, I like to think that some of that's going to make a difference. I, I, I agree with you. I really hope, hope that they do. And I hope they, they take heed of that. And, you know, one of the other comments that has, has come across my way a lot is, um, you know, a number of people have said, oh, well, the FAA is doing this to clear it for Amazon and, and UPS and other drone delivery companies. And one of the things that, that I've come in real quickly and said is, look, okay, that technology, I don't think we're there yet as far as, you know, next thing you know, my Amazon Prime delivery is going to be dropped off by a drone in front of my house. I don't think we're at that point or even close to it as far as the technology is concerned. Um, well, we, um, it's nice to see some progress, particularly in, in the current uh, pandemic situation on, on drone deliveries. Um, I, I tend to share your view that there's still a number of steps left to, to get that going at scale. And most of the projects tend to be um, pilot programs or, or uh, research. But um, I, I'm not sure I agree entirely with the premise that this proposal is, is a matter of clearing the skies. Um, I, I think it's a couple of things. First, of course, companies that only care about delivery are going to be focused on that. And Remember what I said at the beginning, that, that nothing else gets done uh, for them unless there's remote ID. Why? Because the security agency said so. So if you're a company that wants to do things that you can't do today at scale, and, and remote ID is standing in your way, and you expect to be part of remote ID and traffic management anyway, so this is just no big deal, uh, then of course you just want to move forward and don't care much about other, uh, other UAS users because it's just not something you would care about. And that's kind of understandable. Uh, but that's different from, you know, this is being driven by companies like that. I, I do think it's more accurate to say that the security community is driving this in a way that is arguably unreasonable. And it kind of ties back to the beginning of our discussion tonight. Um, when I said, you know, security outcomes are driving a lot of drone policy, you know, here you go. So, it, you know, the the, the desire to have broadcast and network is probably more driven by a, a sort of a, a desire by security stakeholders to know it all and have it available everywhere, much like a you know license plate tracking database would provide lots of interesting information if you were a security official. But at some point, there needs to be a balance between security interests and civil rights, civil liberties, uh, just the interest of technology, what's reasonable cost hassle. You know, government's supposed to balance competing interests. And clearly there's a competing interest between um, all-knowing security and freedom to operate and privacy as well as cost. So someone's supposed to figure that out, um, namely the FAA. But I, I do think they're, they've they been under pressure for three years now uh, to come up with remote ID in a way that satisfies security agencies. I think that's that's much more the case. And then you've got the, the industry companies um, who want to do other things beyond remote ID, and they don't care that much about the remote ID outcome, but they're being held up because of the security requirements. So they're happy to sort of give everything away, or you know, let's just let's just say yes and move on, in order to move forward with um, with drone rulemaking and, and advanced operations. So I think that's maybe a more nuanced uh, uh, way of looking at what you're suggesting. Uh, it's it's more complicated than. Uh, and by the way, I, I should call out uh, uh, Wing, formerly Google, for, for being very supportive on uh, the sort of the, the standards-based approach, the ARC recommendation of either or, trying to be reasonable, um, as well as protecting uh, the uh, innovation that comes from model aircraft uh, and amateur hobbyist operations. If you read their comment, I, I think you'll see that uh, even among the big players in the industry, who want to do delivery, there, there are uh, reasonable uh, opinions and, and perspectives um, out there if you look for them. 
You know, I know a number of people have said they're hesitating in buying a new drone this year because of remote ID, because they're not they're not sure what the changes will be. They're not sure if their Mavic 2 that they're going to buy tomorrow is going to be able to work, say, you know, in January of 2021. You know, and, and I tell everybody, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of us, as far as drone content creators, like to emphasize is get the drone that's going to meet your needs right now, okay? Um, you know, and, and I know DJI is having sales, and, and I know, like, you know, the Mavic 2 Pro series, the Mavic 2 series, you know, I, I know there's, there's, you know, the Father's Day is coming up. I know there's going to be a sale on it. You know, it's just these happen from now, you know, every time. And you can get some great deals. And, and I, I can tell you from a, a content creator standpoint, you know, uh, the Mavic 2 Pro is, is just one of, is just an exceptional drone for me because it's, it's done everything I've asked it to and then some. And then, you know, the, the creativity and, and the ingenuity that DJI, and, and I've always said this on my show, Brandon, and I said, you know, DJI never wastes technology. Um, you know, they're always, you know, a step ahead. They're always wanting to keep moving up above. And, and I think that's fantastic. But what do you say to people who are saying, well, you know, I just kind of, you know, remote ID, I want to wait till next year. What, what do you say to people like that? I, I don't think it makes any sense to make purchase decisions now on, on the basis of remote ID uh, for a few reasons. Um, if you look at the FA proposal, first of all, they're, they're working to finalize it by the end of the year, but I don't know that they'll be able to accomplish that. That's, that's aggressive. Uh, so it could be that there's at least a year before we see what the final rule is. And then as proposed, there was a three-year implementation period. It's not like overnight your, your, drone, your drones have to comply. Um, also, many of us are uh, hopeful and put into our comments that there should be retrofit options. Uh, particularly if you can do a broadcast, it would be pretty easy to stick on a, a broadcast transmitter to comply with remote ID. And I hope that that is permitted um, across all technologies so that no one uh, across any brand would need to throw out their equipment, uh, which would just be an environmental problem as well as a waste of money. Um, from, from our perspective uh, on our products, we very much want our drones to be updatable, to, to, to be able to issue a software update that will allow them to comply. Now, I can't make promises because we don't have the final requirements. There are technical issues. It depends on timing, like you know, a product that we released two years ago probably won't get an update two years from now. So when do we have to do it? Uh, depends on a lot of things, but when you think about it, that's like a like maybe a three or four year window of use. So ideally, the, the reason Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are uh, a part of the ASTM standard for this is that those antennas exist on many uh, current products, not just ours. M most drones out there, I think you referred to Parrot, for example, are using some variant of Wi-Fi. So if you can use that existing technology to do the broadcast, you're done. Also, a lot of drones uh, have ground control stations that are connected to the internet, at least some, some of the time. So that could be a potential retrofit, um, a path that's done through a software update on the, on the app as well as the drone to make sure the telemetry is right and all that. So there are a number of different upgrade paths that we hope are zero cost and are done with, with just software updates that we push out. But there's not enough certainty right now in terms of the standard and the FAA's approach, as well as the very important question of, do we need to certify that the product does remote ID? Um, this was in our comment. You know, if, if we have to certify it, then we probably can't do that after we sell the drone because it's under your control. We can apply the remote ID software when we have it, but once it's out in the market, how would we uh, certify that the update has been performed and that it's operating, especially with the, the, the smartphone or tablet that you happen to be using, which we don't have any control over. So if the FAA makes a certify, <laughs> we put this in the comments, if the FAA makes a certify, um, I don't know how we do that for products that already exist. But I have a feeling like that's, everyone recognizes that that's not gonna solve remote ID if we can't uh, address the probably millions of products that are out there in the world already, then how long will it take for for 90% of drones to have remote ID, a long time. So there's gotta be a, a way to upgrade and retrofit one way or the other. And that's why I say, 
don't don't wait with a purchase, whether it's a DJI product or any, anything else. Uh, you're just sort of taking away your own fun or enjoyment or productivity, uh, probably for the next two years at least, uh, while you wait for the government uh, to, to finish its work. And and by the way, just look you know look at other FAA initiatives. I, I think it's it's clear clear to me that um, waiting on the government to get something done uh, is probably not a winning proposition. So I, it would make no sense to me as an avid drone enthusiast going back to the mid 90s or model aircraft for that matter, which I continue to buy and fly. I, I'm not stopping myself from buying something because of remote ID. Well, you know, and, and thank you for, for, for clarifying that, Brendan, because I know a lot of people have said, you know, they're, they're, they're steadfast. They said, okay, if it's under a thousand dollars, I'll buy it. If it's over a thousand, I'm going to wait on it. And, you know, and my, my whole take on it all along has been, if it's going to meet your needs, get it. Because uh, for example, I'll just, I'll just point this out. You know, you talked about adaptability and being able to retrofit. Well, you know, with the Mavic 2 Enterprise series, there was the, there's a notch on the top of them. So you can be able to add this, the loudspeaker, the lights, the, the strobe, you know, and, and obviously, you know, DJI is so incredible. Um, you know, they'll come up with something. Parrot will come up with something. Autel will come up with, I mean, all the drone manufacturers will come up with something to make it easy to do something like that. So don't rob yourself of, you know, for, you know, if it's your profession, don't rob yourself of that. Don't, if it's, if it's a hobby for you, uh, don't rob yourself of that joy because, you know, some of the greatest pictures and video I've ever taken have been from 150 feet up in the air. I mean, you know, and, and it's all about timing. That's what I say on the channel. And I really preach that, you know, when you go out to fly, you know, and trying to get that perfect picture, that perfect sunset or, you know, the perfect video, you know, it, it's all about, it's all about timing, you know, and, and that's one of the things for me that I absolutely positively enjoyed. And it's, and it's, it, it's something that, that I really like. Brendan, it's been, it's been great having you on the show. I really appreciate your time because I know, I know you're quite busy and um, we want to thank you for all you do for DJI. I follow you on Twitter all the time. Um, you know, you put out some great tweets and I'd encourage everybody to follow Brendan on, on Twitter. Um, he's very active and very involved and, and I really like that. And I also too, I also want to let you know, um, and, and I pass this on to a lot of people, you know, as far as, you know, DJI support is concerned. And I tell them, one of the things that I tell them all the time is I have, I have had incredible, I, I, yeah, I'll say incredible, I won't call it luck, but um, response from DJI support whenever I've engaged them on Twitter. You know, and I tell everybody, you know, have your facts for whatever has happened, have a receipt or a bill, your, 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 your bill of purchase, um, you know, have details to be able to give to them. If you need to have logs, have logs available. And I'll tell you what, Brendan, every single time I've gotten the answer back, you know, sometimes it's not what I wanted to hear, but they've gotten back to me and they've gotten back to me in a timely manner. I think that's fantastic. Well, I, I, I appreciate the conversation and uh, do welcome people to follow me on Twitter. The handle is drone laws. Uh, and I, I do respond to direct messages there uh, as I can. So if you have question that comes out of uh, this program, uh, just drop me a line and uh, happy to try to get your response. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you for the great work that you do. Thank you for being a great advocate, not only for DJI, but for all of us hot, hot drone hobbyists and, and professionals out there. We really appreciate that. Thank I want you. to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And remember, as always, it's a great day to fly. Take care, everybody.